advantage to that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, after terminal multiplexing, we will be discussing two topics uh, a little bit more advanced about cond environments, another tool for you having your own environments with your software that uh, yeah, prepare and adjust it for your needs. And so for containers, uh, it's another topic for getting an isolation on, on soft software and, uh, on a cluster. So uh, finally, uh, finally uh, on day four, we will be discussing uh, Git uh, version control. You know, what example about that? Uh, compiling codes. How compilation works on a cluster on, on, on a Linux machine, a Unix machine, and the little nuances about uh, compilation uh, and optimization for a specific cluster. And finally, we will make a very small introduction on shell scripting. Uh, a few commands like grab, uh, uh, awk, or uh, small scripts that could help you to accelerate some execution. Um, so first, how would we enter on the cluster? Um, so for entering the cluster, all that you need is a computer, Windows, Mac, or Linux, doesn't matter, uh, and an application. The application is called a terminal and a SSH client. Uh, so here we have uh, a few tools for each um, operating system that you eventually have on your computer. If you are working on Windows, uh, you probably will need uh, either this one, buddy, or this one, Mobile Extra. Uh, this provides you a terminal and an SSH client. Uh, you can just click here or here uh, for uh, for downloading those those um, packages um, if you want. Another alternative, if you want to feel a more uh, more into the experience of, of of using Linux on your own computer, a very nice solution is to install the Windows uh, subsystem for Linux, and I will show you how that, how that works. Uh, another operating system like Mac OS. Uh, uh, the terminal is already integrated, so uh, it's usually under applications, utilities, um, and there you can click the terminal uh, and it will be right there. Uh, for connecting our cluster, I will show in a minute, just, just start typing the command uh, yeah, for doing so. And on Linux, the terminal is so big used that uh, you will have a terminal somehow around your, your desktop, your taskbar, or something. Uh, usually is like a tiny little monitor um, with a black screen and the exact icon uh, varies between distribution, but it's usually something like that. Um, now, how you connect to the cluster? Most of you will be con will connect to Turing Plaid, I think. Uh, but if you are connected to Spruce, which is our older cluster, this is the command for doing so. Uh, on, on the terminal, you just execute SSH space, your username, add the Spruce HPC WDD. So that will give you a direct connection to this cluster. For our newer cluster, which is not located in campus, is in Pittsburgh, um, and the command line, uh, you need two commands for doing so. First, you connect into this machine, SSH, WU, username. And, and after, once you enter your credentials, do all, all that, you land, you enter this command with your username again to connect to the cluster. So uh, there are two steps on this, um, but uh, at the end, the effect is the same, you end up on a machine with uh, uh, what is called the head knock of the cluster. So uh, in the meantime, while you try this, uh, let's start with the introduction.
So more commands here you can you can see here a little bit like this. Oh, by the way, uh, if you want a uh, Linux uh, operating system running on top of your Windows, this is something that you can uh, consider. It's called the WSL. It's part of Windows. It's something that uh, Microsoft has created for, for Windows. It's basically a, a layer. It's actually a very light virtual machine um, for version two that allow you to install Linux distributions on top of your Windows machine. Um, the commands are, 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 are relatively simple uh, and they are described here. So what exactly what you have to do. Um, after that, you enter in your Windows store and you can like uh, download, for example, Ubuntu. That's what I recommend if you want to do so. Um, and after that, you will have Linux like an application inside your Windows machine. And from there, you can execute all the commands that you will learn today. Everything from your own computer is it, it, perfectly okay. Um, okay, uh, for the materials, uh, once you have entered on, on the cluster, or if you want to do this on your own computer, at least for today, it's just fine if you just want to work um, on, on your own machine in case that you install something like this stuff. Uh, you need to don't go, you can download the materials or so examples and, and tiny little codes that I've created for, for this uh, workshop. And they are here. So once you enter, go here and execute this. By the way, and I think it's on, on, on the chat, the link for this uh, web page. So where you can uh, search for it, so you don't have to type this. You can just copy and paste this on your on your terminal. So uh, it will make things easier. Um, and all the materials for this workshop will be inside a folder called Workshops Hands On Introduction underscore HPC. So let's start with the first uh, with the first one. So in the meantime, you can start listening to me uh, or listening to me uh, uh, getting into the cluster. I will give you a, a, at the end of this a few minutes uh, to get everyone on board. So uh, what is high performance computing? What is uh, an HPC cluster? And uh, basically the objective of this session is to familiarize yourself with the um, concepts uh, and wording of this area, the kind of words that we will repeat over and over again during uh, uh, all these days. So first, uh, uh, high performance computing is all about size and speed. A uh, uh, high performance computing, uh, a supercomputer in general, is a machine that due to its size and speed is capable to perform uh, operations much faster than any computer, any desktop or laptop computer that you have. Uh, uh, one particular class of supercomputers are called clusters. They are made of something that resembles relatively close uh, to a normal computer, a stack of computers. Uh, other cluster, other supercomputers are built as an, an entire machine uh, that is not so easily divisible into nodes on computers, separate computers. Um, but most of supercomputers today are HPC clusters. Uh, one way of making sense about the difference between a normal computer and high performance computer no, or a cluster. Uh, it starts by getting a feeling about the specs on your own computer uh, and compare those with what we can have on a high performance computer class. Uh, so here I have a few tabs uh, for you to search on your own computer. Uh, what is, are the specification of, 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 on your own machine? So in the case of Windows, uh, you can go here on the PC with the, uh, with the 
right um, button on the, on, on the mouse uh, and ask for, for properties and you will get some information like this. So it will tell you the kind of processor that uh, that we have, that you have, the amount of memory. And basically that's what we are interested in at this point. So uh, go and check your own computer um, if you don't know the, the actual specs um, and check for those two numbers or, or those two pieces of information, the processor and the RAM. In the case, if you are using a Mac OS, um, on the top left, uh, on the on the actual Apple, um, uh, you click there and and you click about something uh, the title about Mac, this Mac, and you will get pretty much the same information there. So the processor and the amount of RAM um, that uh, you have on that machine. In the case of Linux, it varies depending on on the exact distribution. But it will be something like this. If you are using something like Ubuntu, uh, there is a K info center where, where you can get information about the processor and the RAM. Uh, if you are using Linux Mint, for example, that is like a, a, another variant of a Debian like distribution, there is a system info where you can see uh, again the processor and the RAM. Um, and there are variants of that. This is, for example, for Linux Mint, uh, the cinnamon uh, flavor. Um, again, the CPU. Are... Right now, we're interested in you paying attention to this couple of numbers. Um, and, uh, and we, in a minute, for the exercise, we, you will have the opportunity to check those with the cluster, with uh, what we have on the cluster. The point is that, as you will see, typically the uh, an HPC cluster is not much different from a, from a normal computer, except for the RAM. Uh, that is evident that uh, uh, the amount of RAM on a, on a typical computer node is much higher than, than on a normal computer. Um, but the CPU could be quite similar. Uh, the exact, the, the exact models and the exact specs that differ, the kind of CPUs that are chosen for a, for a consumer product compared for an for a industrial or, or high performance computing uh, system. Um, so now, a cluster is built uh, of, of, of aggregations of computers connected uh, with a very expensive, sometimes very, very expensive uh, network uh, interfaces, but they are basically computers. A yeah, very cheap way of, of building cluster is just stacking actual towers. Uh, and back in the 90s, that's what people did, uh, stacking towers one near to each other uh, for performing calculations. So each individual uh, computer in the cluster is called a node. And uh, there is just one node or a few that are special are the machines where you connect into, and those are called head nodes. In a big, big, big cluster, uh, they will have several. In our cluster, one is enough. So that's what we have. When you execute the commands that I showed you before about connecting to the cluster, that's what you are doing. You are making a few commands that will, through internet, connect you and put you in, in the ability to execute commands um, on what is called our head node. Um, okay. Could you increase the size, the text on that page a little bit? Um, Very good. Better? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so again, uh, an HPC cluster have nodes. Most of the nodes are called compute nodes. Those are the machines that actually perform the calculations. One or just few uh, are head nodes are the machines where people land when they enter. 
uh, you are not supposed to run anything numerical intensive, any computational intense operation on a head node because you are hurting other people. And eventually, if you are pushing that machine too far, you could actually crash or, or, or really prevent other people for running anything on the clock, on that machine. So this is not a machine that's supposed to do anything numerical intense or computational intense. Um, another thing is that when you are using your own machine, uh, you can do pretty much whatever you want on that. You, you have the control in that machine. That is not the case on a cluster. The cluster or the HPC infrastructure is meant to be used by many people. So first, you don't have full control of the machines. There are many things that you cannot do. Um, and second, the idea is that these people, the, these machines or the machines that are behind the compute nodes are used orchestrated for many people. So many people is, is being served by those machines. Um, so for doing that, we have what is called a queue system, uh, a program, a package that runs on those machines that basically distributes the workload between all those nodes. In our case, we have like 151, around 100, 150 compute nodes. Uh, uh, running on the on, for executions there, uh, one head node. So when you execute on the cluster, you are supposed to use the queue system. And we will see this tomorrow, I think, um, how you use that. For the commands that we will be executing today, they are very light, so you can do, you can execute those on, on the head node, no problem. Um, so now, Let's go more into the terminology of this. A normal computer or an HPC cluster node, pretty much the same. They have a set of components for, for a computer inside. Um, one of those is what is called a central processing unit. Back in the 90s, 80s, uh, there were uh, a huge variety of those. Uh, Today, that has been narrow and is enlarging a little bit more uh, in the recent days. So until uh, a few years ago, basically most of the market, the entire market was dominated by uh, two companies for the consumer, for the consumer market. So uh, AMD and Intel. Uh, so most likely uh, your computer is using one of those uh, CPU. Uh, today, there is just one that has been added to the list. Uh, there are those that they are. So eventually, uh, eventually, one of you could have one of the new computers that are um, built with ARM. Uh, or uh, Apple has been entering on uh, changing the entire line into a, a different, a different processor late night. Themselves, uh, so the the variety of CPUs is enlarging a little bit uh, in recent years. Um, but this paragraph holds: most of your computers are uh, either from Intel or from AMD. Now, today, uh, starting around 2000s, I'm really making very clear on 2004. Uh, most computers or, or CPU uh, uh, vendors start adding more cores to the CPU. Before in the night, by the back in the night, one CPU had just one core. And if you just need more performance, you can just sit down and in two years, the next computer will be twice as powerful as the computer that you have before. And uh, that's no longer the case. And they cannot make the, uh, the processor faster due to thermodynamic uh, constraints. There's physics in there uh, that prevent from uh, cores from, from being faster without uh, producing as much heat per, per unit area as a nuclear power plant. Um, so 
the solution for that is increasing the area and increasing the amount of cores. So um, CPUs today usually have four cores, eight cores, and our machines on Thorning Plant, they have uh, two sockets to actually CPUs on, a, on, on one main board. Uh, and each CPU um, for most of our compute nodes have 20 cores. So on a compute node, we have 40 cores total. Um, okay, so one important message here is that all machines, all computers today, even your cell phone, are most electronics of that kind are multi-core, all of them. Um, and that trend will probably not change. That, that, that is the reality. Um, now, there is something, especially for the consumer market, that, are, the, that could be confusing for some, is the concept of hyper-threading. It's basically saying to the operating system uh, that the computer has more cores than it actually has. Um, the idea is that by telling that to the operating system, the actual processors, uh, actual processor is able to reorder the this, this stack of operations that uh, is trying to execute more efficiently than just telling the processor that, that the CPU actually have a certain number of cores. So on your computer, you probably can see that more or less evident uh, that you have four cores and uh, and it's doing multi-threading, so it's appearing like I as having eight uh, uh, what it, they call logical cores. Um, in general, on an HPC cluster, this is something that we disable. So, and the reason for that is that. Uh, there is little advantage on enabling multi-threading when you are executing a lot of numerical calculations, very intense calculations. Um, for something less HPC, uh, more like Python things, or uh, 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 things like that, or maybe there is an advantage of enabling hyper -threading. But in general, we disable that and, uh, and we clean a little bit uh, the, the execution for for, for many people. So, but notice that on your own computers, on your desktop computers, this is something that is typically enabled on um, hyper -threat. So you will see more cores that you actually have. Now, CPU frequency. Back in the 80s and 90s, um, this figure, was the dominant figure of a CPU. People didn't ask for, for, for much uh, other than what's this, the, the clock speed of this process. So it's 200 megahertz, and now you buy a 400 megahertz, and now back in, that's in the night, um, 800 megahertz, and they reach up to one gigahertz. And, uh, and, and every two years, basically, that speed uh, doubles. And, and the performance of the computer was highly or is strongly attached to that figure. Um, that's no longer the case. Um, this computer, this is a Mac from 2013, it has basically the same uh, clock speed that uh, my Mac from 2019. It's, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, the difference is that the, the number of cores change um and they are able to perform more operations on one clock cycle so the frequency is no longer the dominant figure for the performance is the ability of pipelining so those executions that are done in one cycle um, and the ability to move more data into the processor and uh, again, the reasons for that is that the frequency is attached to the power consumption. Power consumption is, uh, is basically uh, thermal dissipation uh, and that thermal dissipation for by unit area uh, will be prohibited if you increase beyond 10 gigahertz. 
So you can still do it, but you have to basically submerge the computer in liquid nitrogen or something like that to prevent of melting, um, which becomes extremely expensive. Um, so now, a processor will have instructions like those, AVX, AVX2, AVX512, you will see those popping uh, around uh, in these lectures. Uh, in our case, in the, in the computers that we have on the cluster on Thorny, they are all AVX512. So they are capable of doing, I think it's four or a uh, single precision floating operations per, per cycle. But it depends on the operation. Uh, it, it becomes more complex. Uh, on the Spruce, most of the machines, or I think all machines are AVX and some machines are AVX too. So and they are like five, six years old. Um, so those extensions are now important in giving performance to those machines. Um, no longer the, uh, the actual CPU speed. Um, uh, okay, and there is something that I hear that the word mentioned. Um, on consumer products, especially for gamers, uh, there is this concept of overclocking. It's basically pushing the CPU beyond the uh, limits declared by the, by the vendor um, in order to extract more performance of, of that machine. Uh, people do that and they add uh, a special uh, dissipation uh, objects like uh, like liquid dissipation or uh, uh, better uh, grids, uh, aluminum grids for dissipating the extra heat generated. Uh, because if the the, uh, the uh, CPU hits a lot, the difference between ones and zeros become very narrow. And at some point, the the, uh, the CPU could make a mistake. And that is not that bad for a game. The game will crash, but you can continue somehow. But this is something that is out of the list of possibilities for an HPC cluster. So we are not doing overclocking at all. Another thing is that as we are packing more cores on our machines, if you see the number, the speed or the actual uh, CPU frequency on our cluster, on the machines on our cluster, is actually lower than a Mac or, or your computer. And the reason for that is that by lowering those figures, the, the clocks, the, the, the processor is, li is, is slightly slower, but also the less heat, um, but we have more cores, so we balance that balance the speed with numbers. Um, and at the end, uh, what we want on an HPC cluster is for that for really, really HPC executions, HPC is synonymous of parallel, parallel program. So there is no point of making one processor faster. We just want uh, a lot of processors working together. So now cache. Cache is an important concept uh, on a CPU. Uh, uh, if you see, for example, intermarket products like Core i3, Core i5, Core i7, Core i9, um, and one important distinction between those mm, uh, and that branding um, is the amount of cash on, on those on, on those videos. Um, and there are several levels of cash. Cash is basically a very very high speed memory that is inserted in the same CPU, in the same, in the same chip with, the, with, the, with all those cores. So there is a, a cache level one that is really, really attached to each core. And there is cache level two that uh, could be uh, uh, also attached to, to, to the core. And there is usually a cache level three that is shared among, uh, across all the cores on the same socket. Um, uh, and different um, uh, lines, in the, for example, in the consumer line, uh, Core, I, Core i3 has lower uh, cache compared with Core i5 on Core i7. 
even if the speed is the same, the amount of cash is what allows the, the, the CPU to inject more, uh, to get more data for processing. Um, and the cash is a very important uh, element in the pricing of those CPUs. Uh, so, so that's why they, they did it that way. That's a, a core right now, for example, in the, uh, in the most recent MacBook is something like 12 or 16 megabytes, which is really, really large for, for uh, compared for, for example, for Night 3 that could have two megabytes, you know, let's say a low, uh, a basic computer could have like two or four megabytes of, of cache on uh, level three. So this is an important question. This is something that is extremely important for us. So the machines that we choose for our cluster usually have a very large cache. And you will see that in a minute when you start executing the, the first exercise uh, into this. So um, if you have a computer uh, like with Intel, AMD, I'm sorry if you are using an ARM, I don't have the, uh, the equivalent for the ARM side. Um, you can go into these websites and check your 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 CPU, you uh, and check the specs. Uh, and do it and, and, and get a feeling about what is in there. And we will see that in the, in the exercise for our class. Uh, storage. Um, storage is another important area in an HPC cluster. Um, typically, your own computer, you have your own hard drive. If you have a good computer, you have an SSD drive, which is much is 10 times faster, around 10 times faster than a physical moving plate uh, hard drive. Um, in the case of a, a, of a cluster, what we have is an entirely separate machine for the storage. There are actually several machines for the storage. Um, uh, first, we could, what we have is a bunch of hard drives that work together. First, because that allows the system to move data faster because the data is actually located in different drives. And second, it gives uh, resilience for this machine in case the one, and in the worst case scenario, two of those drives fail, all the data can be recovered because the data is duplicated, or is replicated somehow across multiple, multiple physical drives. Uh, so that's why the, the system is so different. Another thing is that in, on your computer, you probably have a few terabytes of data or, or, or hard drive. Uh, in the case of our cluster, we have like something like, I think 700, almost a petabyte, uh, 700 terabytes or, or, or up to one, probably close to a petabyte of, of storage space uh, aggregated. So that another big difference in, in a cluster. Finally, network. Uh, on your computer, you probably are using, uh, you're connected to the internet or using your Wi-Fi. Uh, another option is to have an Ethernet cable and you are connected directly to the router. And these machines for an HPC cluster, all those machines are connected together uh, using a very special network that is uh, expensive, it's a big part of the, of the cost of those machines. Uh, and they give you that expense networking, uh, provide you two features. One is a large bandwidth. Think about it like the lines on a highway, so how many cars you can move there. And latency, how fast you can move data in the limit of the, of, of the data being too small. So what, what is the amount of time that you need to uh, wait until you get one bit of data from one lab, from, from one computer to another? Uh, yeah, usually that is in the order of microseconds, and, uh, but that's not enough. So for, for these networkings, they lower the figure of the numbers. So that is important if you are transferring a lot of data between machines, which is the case if you are to, if you are running a, a distributed parallel computing on that. So for the uh, next minutes that I have, 
I propose a few exercises or a couple, one exercise is actually very small uh, for you is go into the cluster uh, on the head node and execute this command. The command is just the blue thing. Now forget about this. This is to tell you that this is a command on the terminal. You just go into the cluster, follow the instructions and execute this. There you will see the model of our uh, of the computer in our head node um, and go into this website and check the specs. Check around the cache, for example, um, the number of cores on that, on, on that, on that CPU, that information. Another thing is go and check again on the head node with this command uh, and you will see the amount of RAM that we have. You will see something like that, 90 something, which is a large amount of memory for compared with a desktop computer. A desktop computer will have like 8, 16, 24, 30, uh, I don't uh, know. In extreme, in a very extreme case, you will have something like 64 gigabytes of RAM, um, but uh, not probably not more than that. Otherwise, it would be probably a work station or something very special. Um, our a small machine here, a small compute node on Thorny has 90, 90 something, 90, 90 gigabytes of RAM. And we have a few machines with 760 something and gigabytes of RAM. So that is another important element uh, that differentiates a compute node with a normal uh, desktop or laptop or whatever. Uh, so we have a few minutes, we have like 10 minutes um, now. So do it, I will be paying attention to the chat in case that you have problems and I can help you. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and up the last minute, I will show you the commands uh, here on terminal. And I will discuss a little bit about what we can find. Daniel, can they uh, open the, mic the microphone or, or they are not? Uh, yeah, they should be able to. Because we have, uh, we have just eight people, so we can make this easier for people. We allow them to. I'm trying to figure out if that is something.
if any one of you uh, have any questions, um, please do so. If, tell me if you are not able to execute the commands. Um, otherwise, I will just uh, discuss and I'll at least talk to you about the, the, the kind of things that you can do. So first, when you log into the cluster, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you get something like this. So the sag shape colors are mine. That's my my tweet on this. Um, but the important thing is that you have this um, uh, this word uh, on on the prompt. This indicates that this is a computer. It's a head node. This is the name of our head node. So this is one uh, one important thing to check that you are actually on the head node. And uh, if not, when you just execute, you land on this machine with this different with this name that is different here. This is not the head node. This is the first machine where you land. First uh, uh, machine. So check if you are here or in. in uh, Perfect. So another thing is that, and we will see this in a minute, commands on the Linux, you just type. And for make the things easier for you, you just, you can have hit tab. And you will see all the commands, all the things that you can do that is start, for example, with LS. Um, and we will be checking, for example, from our exercise, LS CPU. On the head node, you will see this. And this is the piece of data that I asked you to, okay, to capture. I'll, I'll list this number, 6126. I'm going to ARC, um, Intel, and check the specs for, for this for the CPU. Um, in, any way, in any case, most of the specs that are relevant to us I already hear uh, the clock speed, the current clock speed. Those those CPUs are, are actually capable of uh, switching back and forth between a high clock and a low clock. Um, in case that they are not running intense calculation, that save energy uh, and, and, and heat. And, uh, uh, so that's why it's 1000 right now. Uh, but they can go up to 3.7. Uh, and I don't think that this is the actual, not the, the natural speed is this one. When they do, when they go to 3.7, they usually disable some of the cores to raise the speed on one particular core. So, so this 3.7 gigahertz at the set expense of reducing the, num the effective number of cores that are executing. Um, this is all the information about the cache, the cache level one, level two, and level three. Uh, notice that this machine has an important amount of cache, it's 19 megabytes, which is really, really large um, compared with a normal computer. Uh, you notice that the speed is not that it's not that different. Uh, and computers today, the, the speed is probably, probably the same. Uh, it's not longer this element that matters. Um, they have something uh, that I can have a couple of minutes to discuss. Um, just a small detail. So uh, in these kind of machines where you have multiple um, sockets, uh, the main board has all the memory and both cores or both CPUs can see all the memory, but they cannot see all the memory at the same speed. So they have different different access speed uh, to different memory. That is called NUMA, which is, means non-uniform memory access. Uh, so 
one portion of the memory is closer to one CPU, another half of the memory is closer to the second CPU. And it's basically here telling you that we have two NUMA sections. Uh, and so the, the entire memory of the machine is spread uh, into those two sections. So the, the operating system will try to do the best to put the memory related to each core in, in the right in the right side. And um, also um, here, newer processors have this extensions abx 512 which is not actually a one set of extension it's actually like a zoo of, of extensions a different processor implement one of another so they are telling you here the kind of extensions that are enabled or capable on this on the cpu uh, and they are responsible if you compute uh, if you compile certain codes enabling these, these capabilities uh, to perform better. It typically is 10, 15, in some extreme cases, 20% faster when you enable those things. Um, so those are the kind of things that you can get from, from, this, from this command. Another command that I asked you was something like this, the memory and this machine it's mentioned here, the total amount of memory of 96, basically 96 uh, gigabytes of RAM, which is which is large compared with a desktop computer. It's a small considered that this is the smallest amount of memory that we have on, on our cluster on a computer node. We have machines with with 760 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, and there is this command, but this one is. Uh, it's a lot of information about uh, the different devices on, and all of them, our CPUs are from the Sky Lake uh, generation. Um, so you will see a lot of those things there. And all. So, yeah. anyway. so now let's move to the next topic. which is the command line interface. Usually the way you interact with a computer, the desktop computer, is with your keyboard and most likely or most of the time with your mouse. Okay. Click here, you click there, you click buttons everywhere. Uh, that's not how you're supposed to interact with a cluster. Okay. With a, uh, the recent servers, uh, the, the uh, first, the uh, shell interface, the terminal interface is much lighter for the computer. Uh, so many people who log into that machine without putting a lot of pressure on holding multiple graphic user interface and many people clicking with their mouses on different places. So graphic user interfaces are, are pretty much uh, a bad way of using an HPC browser. Some people do, but this is not, the point is, this is not the most efficient way of, of doing it. Um, so the way you interact with that is what is called a shell. A shell is basically something that is expecting from you to type a command, hit enter, it will execute something, return that information back to you, and put you in position for executing the next command. This process is called REPL. So read the command, evaluate the command, print the output of that, and start auto. And that's how a command line interface works. Uh, in many cases, doing everything fine, it re means return nothing. So we will see those cases where, where not seeing anything means everything was good. Um, and you type whatever you want on the terminal, but it only reads that when you execute enter. It's not reading, it's not interpreting anything except until, except when you hit enter. Uh, another thing is that 
terminals in general, the way you interact with these computers uh, is, it's very strict. You cannot make typos. You are, it, the, the computer will not figure it out that you want to type this instead of this. Uh, in the case of Linux, Unix in general, uh, is a case sensitive. So the command in, in it's usually lowercase. The command in lowercase doesn't exist or has a meaning at all. Uh, so pay attention to those things. Uh, they are important. Now, the shell is basically what you see on the terminal when you're logging with the kind of things that I show you here. Uh, and this is more bar. So this bar here, this thing, is called a prompt. It's just and like a board or, or a small measures saying the user, please enter the command here start typing it. I'm ready to receive comments. Um, the way for identify that in our text and our document here is with this dollar sign. I usually put a dollar sign or dollar uh, greater than for making that distinction. And you are not supposed to type this. You are not supposed to type that to type the dollar and the, and the greater than. You are supposed to type whatever is after that. Uh, so the first command that I would like you to type while I'm, while I'm talking is this command for example, ls dash space dash al. Spaces are important. Uh, if you type a command, for example, like this, uh, this doesn't matter too much. You can type a command with some extra spaces in front it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter too much if you put a lot of space here. It matters if you don't put any space at all. So, I know. Um, so, why we use the command line interface? Again, it's simple. It's, for the, it's light. It's a light interface for, for interacting with a computer. Uh, in general, all that you need for using the fastest computers on our uh, HPC cluster is any machine that gives you a keyboard and a screen and allow you to connect with SSH into that machine. And you run on that machine. Whatever you have on your own machine is relevant. If you don't have a very powerful uh, GPU graphics or them, it doesn't matter. All that you need is a machine to connect into that into a remote machines and type commands there. So that is also something that makes things lighter. Um, now, uh, clicking buttons on, on a screen on a graphic user interface, user interface has its own limitations. If someone asks you to put the banner, happy birthday or something on, on, on a figure, you open a graphic editor and you click here, there, you choose the, the fonts and you type happy birthday or something like that. But if someone asks you to put the name or something on the, in the bottom of, of a figure and they give you 10,000 images to for doing that, you will not start opening 10, thousand images one by one and typing something with buttons. You script that. You put that in some form where that is executed for all the, all the images. So the command line interface is one step closer of give you that level of, of power uh, on your fingertips. Um, so for, and at the end of this of this workshop, we will introduce a little bit of shell scripting, uh, so you will get a feeling of all the things that you can do with shell that are beyond what we are showing in this uh, short introduction. Um, for the purpose of this lesson, we just have one hour, so my objective here is show you ten comments, just ten comments. Uh, and with that, you can do most of the things that you can imagine on, on, on a cluster. There are things that you, that you can do later, 
uh, with more commands that they extend these leads uh, quite a bit. But those 10 commands are the bare minimum uh, that you need to learn. Now learn those and you are in a good position for, for interacting and using the class. So the first command. So we will go and use commands in, in a couple, so we, we cover those like this. So echo and cat. Echo and cat are basically commands for showing things on the screen. In the case of echo, it's showing something that you type uh, directly on the screen. Cat is for showing you the contents of, of a file, a text file. O for concatenate. That's actually the, the main purpose of this, is concatenate files. Uh, I display those on the screen or with the use of pipes, redirect that into a, a single point. So it's a concatenator. That's actually the, the, where the, came, the name came from. Um, so that is how this works. You just type echo and, and the text, and it will show this on the screen. Seems silly why someone would like to do that, um, but it's actually very useful when you are uh, uh, running simulations or something that you want to have something saying, okay, I did this, and now I am in this step, and the next step of the simulation is doing this. So you put some markers, some milestones on the simulation. So that's how this is actually used uh, in practice. Uh, there are some variables, so the, I'm here I'm showing you how you can expose the content of one variable. Uh, we will see that more in depth for, for the shell scripting. Um, but there are basically two variables here that are important. One is your home folder, is the place where you have your, your main information is 10 gigabytes of the space for you. And, and this is not enough for scientific purposes. So we have a scratch space that is much larger. You can hold 30 terabytes of data if you want, not, not much of an issue. Um, you can also do operations on this. Uh, this is another way of, of working. Uh, executing some mathematical, very basic, usually, just uh, integer arithmetic is, is, is something that you can do this way. Uh, uh, but this could cover some more complex stuff. Uh, it's not the way you will perform numerical calculations by any means, but for some things, it's something that uh, you will encounter. Um, if something is not there, if that is not a command, this is the kind of message that you will receive. Common not found or something. So again, this is a straight. Lowercase is lowercase. You cannot, uh, this is case sensitive. So uh, echo, if you put this uppercase, it will not work. Um, you can redirect the output into a different file uh, with this pipe. Upper kicking right at that. Um, uh, and you can see this later with cat. So uh, let, let, let's do it in practice. So echo hello, something like this works. If you redirect this to uh, uh, to a file, this is the way you do that. And you can see the file like this. You can see the contents of that file. Um, what else? A few variables. Echo my home folder. Notice that this is very sensitive. So, like this, scratch. Um, Again, yes, if you type something X, you can complete the command with just hitting tap. This is something that is pretty useful. Um, what else? Cut. Okay. 
this is why the name is cat. You concatenate this, uh, these files if you want. And really write this. Um, and the file will be, will look like this. Um, you can also do this. And in this case, the file will put the contents of the, um, of the cat after at the end of the, of, of, the, of the current file. So at that moment, the file will have more lines. And something like this, it's another command that we will see later. Uh, and you can concatenate this. And at this point, the file has been emptied. It's clean, it's, it's deleted before. Uh, filling the new, the new one. So, two commands, echo and cat. Now, uh, this command, uh, PW. The structure, the files, the, uh, the content of a computer in the Unix environment, Linux in particular, uh, follows a tree. Uh, Different from Windows that has the C, D drives, things like that. Everything in Linux start with this. This is the root folder. And here we have a few folders and after you can go into So they follow a tree uh, metaphor. Uh, and the command pwd will show you what, which is my current working directory. Bring my working directory. And the reason for using this is that on your own, when you start running simulations on this machine, you will create different folders for different simulations under different conditions. Uh, different constraints work. And so it's important to know where you are in that, in that tree. And another command. So we have three, now, three commands. Um, oh, and also I show you this because I was moving around. And so I have all my folders here. Um, and CD is, command for changing for When you execute CD without nothing, you are returned to your home folder, your own home folder. And, uh, and you can go into different folders, user, PMP, like this. So you type CD and slash TMP. This is another folder we where you have access. There are folders where you have access to see what is inside. Uh, in some others, you can see, but not edit anything. You cannot change anything. There are restrictions in place for different, from different folders. Uh, another command, the first command that I asked you is this, ls. So you can see the contents of, of a folder. Uh, or the type this and the folder that you want to see. Uh, so that's a way of navigating and knowing which folders are about. Um, this one, mkdir. Here, I will create in folders on this. So let's say, for Notice that this folder is different from this one. If I work. Now we have two different folders here. Uh, those are completely different. Case is important. Um, if I'm going to this folder, uh, I date, right there today. So now I have one file. 
Notice that if I type this way, this is not a command. Uppercase, uppercase version doesn't exist. Uh, it's just this one. The content of that file is cat this. So now we have created folders, changing folders. Now, um, oh, yes, yes, I did this. Um, you can create files or folders with the spaces. It's not recommended, but it's doable. Yeah, there are several ways of doing that. Um, you can create, for example, the folder today is This is one way of creating folders with the spaces. But notice that you have to use those skates all the time uh, for making that. Uh, another way of doing that, uh, for example, is without using this. With quotations, double quotes. Um, so there are several ways, but if you try to do this, you will actually be creating folders tomorrow. Be will to. So what people usually do in this case is. Would underscore for making easier for you to move uh, with this force. So, this is another way for making something that is human, humanly understandable. Uh, then you have for another. You can delete folders with this command rmd or you can. And you can delete, you can execute things on multiple uh, commands or multiple options, put in a star. So with this, I am replacing with not having anything here. So we'll delete this one. We'll delete this one. I have any space with this. I will delete this one. Everything that starts with tomorrow will be deleted. Like this, okay. Um, what else? Have to delete folders. Okay, this one. Copy and move here. Yeah. The This is how you rename files or you move files this way. Uh, so let's see, let's create uh, folder. Notice that I'm ex using my the uh, the arrow keys for moving into previous commands. This is another thing that you can do. So I create three folders. Uh, I would create this. So the content of the file is this. And I will be copying this today into folder one. I am copying the files into different folders. And now I cannot longer remove folder three folders. This is something that I cannot do because the folder is not empty. I can delete one, 
the file like this and after delete the folder so i can only delete with this command or in the folders that are empty um, or i can delete recursively a folder like this okay. uh, copy okay this is a small command Uh, okay. When you execute something like this, you will see that a file has some uh, coding here. That this code means the permissions that this file has, the ownership, blah, blah, blah. and the date. The date is declared here. If you want, you can uh, execute this command. And it basically changes the date of modification for this one. It's something that has some use when you are drawing simulations and you want to check something uh, or, or to declare that something has changed. Uh, you touch it, uh, you just reset. Another way is for, uh, for creating an empty file. So, if the file doesn't exist, it will create a new file, an empty file um, with that. And notice that I changed the date. So now I add a couple of minutes. So I update the date to that. It mimics having modified the file, even if the file was not actually modified. Um, what else here? Let's Okay, well, we can, we can show this. Yeah. Okay, let's go. And let's use Touch for creating a few files here. And you can use this kind of um, white cards for selecting a specific files. Oh, put it zero. So with this, you are selecting all the files that start with this uh, contain at the end two, two, three, or four. Uh, another option of doing this is something, something like this. All the files from two to four. Something useful, for example, if you're running a simulation and you're exploring, let's say, something with temperature, 300, 400, 500, 600 Kelvin. So you're, you're covering it. So all the values between this to this will be covered. So, and you can do whatever you want with them. So I can touch those ones. So update the date for the, for that with touch. That will work. And what else? Okay, I show you how to delete files. Okay. I think I can give you some more time for the exercises. And so in summary, I show you 10 commands. Echo, cat for showing files, date, we use it several times for getting the date. Uh, uh, PWD, CD for changing directories, creating directory touch, and CP, MV, and RM for copying, moving, and removing files or folders. Um, this selection was done on purpose because those commands are particularly useful when you were running the script simulations, uh, the kind of things that we use in HPC. So that's why CAD is there, the ECHO is there, has a really, really important. So now I have a few challenges for you. And a, and a few
few minutes for doing those and exploring all, all, all of that. So we'll give you more time for this. Um, so the first exercise is doing yourself. You will have your time for exploring the commands. The LS, yeah. uh, and this command, I move it into a, this command. This is a new command that I show you at the It's a command for showing the calendar. Uh, and I will use it for an exercise, so you will see in a minute how that works. So exploring those commands uh, on the terminal, familiarize yourself with them. Uh, the only way you will actually learn is when you start typing that so many times that that becomes second nature typing those things. Notice if you just make a typo, you move your finger, uh, instead of L, you type K, that the command doesn't exist. This is really, really strict. The, com the computer is, is completely dumb. It doesn't try to figure out what you want to type. If you type it right, okay. If you don't, the command does It will not find you. Okay. And I, uh, this exercise is type the calendar this way. Uh, and you will see the entire calendar for a year. And the date. Type that, familiarize with this couple of them. Now, this requires a little more time, create some folders, put some data in there, move in those files. So basically follow this recipe, this prescription for familiarizing with the creation and moving of files. Now, this exercise is a little bit more challenging, is uh, let's understand this line. It's just one line, but here we are actually programming. Uh, on this line, we start with one, and we are running a loop from here to here, where we are testing if this variable n is greater or less than 10,000. And we will be doing something. We will showing this n and increasing the value of n with a numerical mathematical operation that is computed with this command. And I will show you this command in a minute. So now the, the exercise, the challenge for you is to run this for the calendar and showing you August for the next the, the month of August for the next 10 years. So basically tweak this, it's really simple. Tweak this to show you the, the calendar for this year, next year, and the next year for August. And, and here you can execute this command. That will show you a, a little bit the hints here. Um, for, so calendar has this option here. So you get like a mini uh, manual. So the kind of things that you can do with this command. Uh, most commands will have something like a manual. If you, if you don't know exactly what to do with that command, you hit man, you type man, and the name of the command, uh, and, and they will show you a manual. I don't know if there is, yeah, there is manual for calendar, so you can But if you want just something really, really simple, this is, this is all we need. This is the default. It will show you one month. Uh, so if you ask, for example, for the year 2022, it will show the, that command, the, the entire calendar for the year 2022. Uh, so use this, use this for, for that. Uh, another thing is the expression. The way this is, was working is we were doing something like this. We need to escape the star for making for making the multiplication. But this command is able to compute some basic uh, numerical expressions. So it's not much. It will return zero. It's a pure integer division. And it has something like, I think it has something like this. I don't know, this, 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 this. It's just doing very basic math. 
And so it's something that you can eventually do in something like this. Variables are created like this. So if you execute something like this, this is what you are doing. Um, but it, the reason is more trick for doing that. Um, So the command is here. Somehow I insert that. Yeah, there is a type. It's without this. I don't know what this comes from. Uh, so, yeah, I, I noticed a typo. It's here on here. I insert somehow by mistake this great pen. So, this is not part of the code. So, I will edit this. Is. But now you have some time for running the exercise. And if you have any question, if you get if I stack, please tell me. Uh, uh, and I give you.
Okay, I fix. Uh, it's like this. Can you see the here WVU HPC dot GitHub dot IO introduction dash HPC? Dash is for the lesson, underscore is for the workshop. So workshop is just the front page from the 
how to open this child. So? How to open this child. Oh, this chat is for the Zoom session. I run the Zoom. Ah, let me see. One is for the workshop, right? Yeah. Is there another one you put? The, the workshop redirects to the to the lesson. So the actual material is in the thing. Yeah. And you are able to see the chat. Just the new. How many people do you have in the chat? Yeah, that's right. But, but he said that he just didn't see the messages because he joined like half an hour ago and it doesn't show what's well, uh, I, I, I don't see the old one. Yeah. And um, why I have just eight people right here? I think it's just not showing all of them, but they're there. And there are more people? Yeah. It's just a bunch of websites or something, probably. So that's a serve. What can you Ah, it's showing just the top four. Okay, so if you have any question related to the command line interface or the clusters so far, please propose the question. Otherwise, I will take the extra minutes um, to advance in the terminal based editors, which is a little bit more complex. So feel free to, to ask the question now, or we will move to the next topic for today. I'm getting some minutes. Nope. Okay. So now, the idea is that now you know 10 commands. The next important thing to do on a cluster, on an, an HPC machine or something, uh, is editing text files. You will be editing text files because you are writing the input files for the codes that run your simulations, or you are preparing the scripts that will run on the cluster. Uh, all those things demands you to write a text file, usually a small text file. Or you are looking into the output of a simulation or something, um, and you need to search on a, in that case, usually big file for the data that you are looking for, uh, that, that is relevant for your search. So for those things, you end up, will end up using a text file and text editor. Sorry. 
Um, and we will be talking about terminal-based text editors. Again, because you are on a terminal, you could eventually uh, uh, could have, and we will see one example here where you have access to open windows uh, remotely. Uh, but that's not the most efficient way of, of working on a cluster. So uh, we will be discussing three editors here. Uh, the most common editors in, in Linux, Unix are Nano, Emacs, and um, VI. Uh, if you are really, really new to, it, to this, uh, I suggest you start with Nano. Uh, otherwise, you can go for Emacs or VI. Uh, the selection is a matter of preference, uh, a skill, and need, uh, basically. So now, I will be demonstrating for all those three editors uh, a set of basic skills, what I call basic skills. So the minimal set of uh, tools or, 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 or actions that are give you some leverage on, on an editor for its usage. So one is open and closing files. So that's one very basic thing. Uh, open and save, open, uh, edit and save the file uh, and leave the editor. So this is the first big skill. Move around, move around mini, means uh, go to the first line, the last line, the, the specific line with a number, something like that. Uh, so moving around with uh, the keys for, for scrolling, all that. Uh, second, third skill is copying paste, copying and cutting and pasting tags uh, from one place to another. Uh, and finally, search for a given text uh, or replace some text with some other thing. So uh, if you know those five things on, an, on a given editor, you are in a good position for editing a small point. Not, not going to extreme, but this is the, a, a very good starting point. Which is the difference between the different with all those three editors? Is the ability of them to give you the power to execute more complex operations. So, uh, yeah. for example, uh, in some of those editors, you can cut columns and move the column to a different a different place. So, cutting vertical. Uh, uh, do complex replacements um, uh, with what is called regular expressions. That sort of advanced things. Uh, it's something that you can learn later, uh, and that's beyond what we can achieve uh, in the next hour. So we, uh, this is the idea. We will be focusing in just five skills for all those three editors. The idea is that you choose one and you learn the commands for that editor because that is all that we need for the next session, for the next days. Now, there is a particular uh, comment to be made here related to the meta key. Uh, so in most keyboards, you will see uh, an alt key. An alt key on the right, on left, left and right of the spacebar. Uh, on a Mac, that is replaced by a command uh, command key, and so the name changes. And the alt key is in, on top of the option key. Uh, so there is a, there is a slight uh, difference in the arrangement of those keys and how they were between Mac. Uh, and the, let's say the traditional PC keyboards today. Uh, and in the old times, 
that child uh, used to be something called meta. So that's why uh, when you see the manuals of Emacs or, or AI, uh, they usually refer those to the old MIT keyboards that contains the meta key. Uh, Nano and Emacs use this key a lot. So that's why I have to make this comment. Uh, on VI, you usually can replace those things. So you, or either you don't need it or the escape key will take the place. Um, yeah, back in the 90s, that changed a little bit and that makes the, the keyboard layout that we know today. So, so basically, this is a comment for those who are trying to use Emacs from a, from a Mac that sometimes instead of typing the command or, or out, the keyboard map for the command is typing the state. That's, that's what it is. Here I'm, I'm sitting on a, on a normal computer, in a Windows computer, so I don't, will not have that issue. So uh, now, this is the first editor that we will explore. This is a very simple, a small, user-friendly uh, editor. Uh, most commands, you just hit Control and another key with some other key. And so let's start with the kind of the fire skills. Let's explore the fire skills that we need for this. Um, let's see how we did this. Okay. Mm. Let's review here and, uh, and after I will, I will show you in practice how this works. Um, open a file. You just type nano and the name of the file. If the file doesn't exist, you just type the name that you want and you will be open the file for, for it. You leave the editor hitting Control and X. Um, or you can save the current state of the file with control. Okay. And um, you move to the first line and last line with meta a slash backslash. Um, and you can go in a specific line with control underscore. So let's do it in practice, like things. And you can review the web page. Uh, sorry. So let's see. Let's see. Um, Okay, now let's do something first. Um, this is a good time for me to actually execute to clone the exercises. Yeah. Um, so this is the command. The first command I will be executing to download it, all the exercises, all the no, workshops. Uh, workshops. Here I have it. Okay. Here we will be using this. I will be demonstrating many of these things with uh, with uh, with a file that is big enough. And so it's not easy to move around without with just with the with the kids. So, uh, and this is part of one of the exercises I think the last exercise for today. And um, so you can do it right now, or you will see later how that would work. Uh, is this will download uh, some COVID nineteen data? Um, so now, nano. And the file now is this. The file that I just downloaded is this file here. So nano, I will be editing that one. So notice this file has 108,000 1, lines, more or less. Um, so it's a big file. It's something that you are not, you can do this, uh, by the way, you, you can move with it with the arrow keys, not, not a big deal. Uh, 
actually the lines are so long because this is a CSV file. They have many, 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 many columns that you will scroll all the way. So that is something that you can do. You can move in a line with the arrow keys. Now you can go to the first line or last line with, in my case, Alt and a slash, Alt slash or Alt backslash, as is mentioned here. Uh, okay. So, meta, and we translate that meta as Alt, as you have here. Um, back a slash or a slash to move to the very beginning or last slide. So, alt. It's very hard when you have such a moment of lines on a file. And typically, a simulation uh, produces large files. Uh, so, so, this is not uncommon. And uh, there is a command that is this, I think, to go to a specific line. So I want to go to the line 1001. Now you will go directly to that line. Uh, okay. What else? So, how you open the file? Oh, okay. Open and leave the file. Uh, you can close the file like this. If by chance you introduce something, when you leave, it will ask if you want to save or not the changes. I will say no, and you leave the file. So the first thing is to how you enter and leave the editor. Uh, next thing was going to the first line, to the last line, or to a specific line, control underscore. Uh, we move to a specific line. Now, we are doing all those things for the editor. Um, now, copy and paste. So, meta A for the star selection. So, again, here you are not supposed to use the mouse. I don't think that this mouse would work. Well, uh, yeah, the, the mobile star will give me some, some ability for copying and pasting, but that will be on this side. So it will be this operating system that is copying and pasting. Uh, but you are not supposed to use the, the mouse. So imagine that you are on a such dummy machine that you don't have access to a mouse. Uh, so that this is what you will be doing. So I will go to the first line. Uh, and I will be copying some. So the first, the first copying means, copying and paste means first, selecting something to copy, making a selection. This is the same thing for all the, the editor. Making a selection. And making that selection means deciding a location where something will start making the selection, something where we end the selection, and after copying or pasting. Uh, a given area. Uh, let's see. Control A. Up to here. And Control I'm really not familiar with this. Um, okay. Okay. You make the selection. I think it's this. Okay, and if you want to paste this here, 
is 1 for k. So this basically paste this section here up to here. This is what it is. So basically, no, this, so this one is the section. So I will do that. Yeah, escape A. Okay, A, okay, send back, on six, uh, here I will be making a face for face, control Q. This is how you copy and paste. Make a selection, uh, you start with, with Alt A, you finish with Alt six, uh, and you page with Control U. That is what is really copy and paste. And what else? Search. Okay. Many of those commands, at least those that are really, really uh, useful, most of the time are right here. Uh, and this hat on top. This accent. Um, it means the control key. So for cutting, we have control K. It's just cutting one line, control K. Uh, cutting, control U, and I'm reloading it. Uh, I can search control, control W. United. And he's searching for the entire file, the first location when he finds the given port. Um, what else? So that's searching. Uh, oh, the replace control is slash backslash. And so let me see uh, control backslash. So I'm searching for the United States and I would like to replace it. Oh. Um. And you can say yes or say oh, and it will make all the replies. So this is none. Uh, there are a few other commands. So the, this completes the skills, open, moving, copy, searching. And there are a few others uh, here, many commands here. And this is really, really a very simple editor. So uh, probably all that you can actually do is right here. So, uh, this is with perform. Now, Emacs, let's see, let me, what did it say? No. Okay, nano. Again, this a nano is, should be the first option for you if this is the first time that you are editing files. Because at least you get a, a, a help on the bottom of the screen. The, the commands are really simple. Uh, it's not my editor, that's why I'm not so familiar with it. With it. Um, now let's go into a, uh, another editor, Emacs. Emacs is also relatively simple to use. Uh, 
but at least we need to learn how to enter and leave from this element. Um, so now let Emacs oh, it is. Uh, well, that's the file is really big. Um, but you can still edit this one. So this one is the second easiest uh, in, in the list because at least when you type, it uh, shows directly on the screen, but you are typing. Um, what else? Well, but it's not so easy. They will not tell you how to live on this editor as analytic, nanotech. Um, for leaving this editor is control X C. So uh, is it, uh, is it, oh. uh, yes. So how you type how you type that is you uh, so you hit control and you keep control press and you press X and without control is still down, you press C. And it will say, okay, the file have changed, you want to say it now, uh, and you want to, the morpher is modified, you want to leave, really, really, yes. So that's how you leave. And that is not shown on the screen. So you need to know how to leave this editor. Um, so that's why I classify that this as the second easiest, but second in the list. Um, and when I show you the commands like this, I mean press control and keep the control press. You cannot release the control key until you press the, the entire combination. Otherwise, something else will, will not occur. Let me let me show you. I um, type this and I hit control X and and just release the control key and after press C, it will not work. It will not recognize that command this way. So that is something that the beginners take a little bit because they usually release the, con the, the control key uh, there and, and hit C. So that's why. Um, okay, what else? Okay, moving around is similar. Uh, okay. What is going? I think this is more external, but it's associating back space with something else. And it's
So first line for me is escape less than. Last line is greater than. Um, I think it's okay. The, the alt key is still working. I'm having issues with my backspace. I don't know why, but I think it's more extra that is it is reading that and changing the commands and all. Um, this is how you move to a specific line, uh, to a first and, and last line. Um, oh yes. Uh, and if you want to win a specific line, is escape or out GG. So, uh, so escape twice G and you move to a given line. Uh, what else? Five. Okay. So, control space. Oh, this has a lot of things marked. Okay, now I got it. Yeah, this is more external, so that the my my association client that is reading it is reading the control space and is taking that progress and it is not sending that to the terminal, and it's trying to execute a macro button. So let me see what they can. Okay, so this is how this is supposed to be. So you start with control space for marking a region. You copy that region with control. You, you cut the region with control W and you paste the region with control Y. So let's do it again here, control space. I mark some region, I cut this, and I will make it some space here, and I will paste this here. And it's right here. So this is cut and paste. Selection, control space, selection, control W to cut, control Y to paste. Mm. Control Y, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, search and search is like this. Uh, control S. I guess control S and you try. Um, and this is to replace if you replace it. Uh, 
And there are several options here. If you want to replace all. You can find a card for Emacs here on this link. It's basically this card here uh, that contains of more of those commands beyond the five the five skills that I just showed you. Um, The good thing about Emacs is that you can do many, many things, uh, even reading email, compiling, debugging. Uh, uh, it's a really, really powerful uh, editor. Uh, so if you need or you want this kind of features, uh, it will be a next move once uh, you feel comfortable moving out Nano, for example. Uh, VI. VI is my third editor in the list. So the first editor is easy to enter, easy to leave. They have the command to leave. Emacs, easy to enter, easy to type, but they don't have the command to leave. So you need to learn actually how to, uh, to exit from the editor. And VI is special. You don't know even how to type at the very beginning. Um, How to use control XC? No, uh, okay. Let's 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 review this. Thing. So, uh, I so again, I have a problem with my box. So, uh, what I press is okay. Let let's do this by step. I will be leaving this editor. So I press control. Hit the control is still pressed. It's there, and now I press with another finger C. No. Uh, Control, I need to leave. So if you type something by mistake, you make a mistake, you can clean the, the, the buffer for, for the command with escapes. Control X, you continue pressing Control and press C. Oh, have I escaped it? Uh, okay, Control X, C. Oh. Oh. Here. Control X and Control is still press and after C. You release X to press C. Uh, is that is that clear? Right? Okay. Okay. That, so that that that's the what the, that's the set of commands. Um, and what the mistake that, okay, the problem that I have here is just with the bucket space, it's something that I need to figure out how mobile star is reading this bucket space and disable that thing. Um, and, and when you type something that you didn't want to type, or uh, usually you press escape and you free that, but you have to press escape. Three times, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't appear there. Um, now, via so VI is a special. You don't just when you enter, you enter in a command mode, and so you can hit something like this and pressing J, K, uh, and J, K actually move around. Uh, and L moves forward and H moves power. So 
you are not even typing in this in this so you are in a common mode it's, it's actually receiving commands but not not typing and i'm pressing four keys the four keys for movement which is r though they are h left l for right j for down and k for up so that's another thing that you can explore hopefully. And so how you start typing on this? And well, if you are using a modern version of this, you, the, the, the actual arrow keys work for you. So that's all. So how you start typing? Mm, okay, before, how you leave from this editor? Um, you press escape, you press column, and you will see the column down. You press Q and an exclamation mark. This is how you leave this thing. If you enter in this by mistake and you don't want to use it, that's that's the first thing that you need to learn is how to leave from this thing. Uh, and it's like that. So now, how you start typing on this thing? For typing, you need to, in, to enter in and in what it's called an insert mode. Uh, you press I, so just when you enter, you just press I, and you notice that on the bottom of the screen, you will see the, the word insert. In the case you are using BI in, I think the, the original BI will not tell you anything in which mode it's actually right now. And now you can touch. Then you can tie whatever you want uh, as usual. So you are in insert mode. Um, so, oh yeah, that's the first thing. Um, now, moving to the very beginning is with escape. I usually uh, escape move you out of any specific uh, mode. So put you in back in the common mode. So escape column one and it moves to the right to the first column the, the first uh, the first line on the text uh, you want a specific line so you type the line that you want to go and uh, it's this one uh, you want to go to the last one so you space column and uh, dollar sign and you go to the last line that is how you move around with with the app. So it's simpler. It's simpler than Emacs, for example, in the sense that you don't need more than ten fingers on your hand to, to, to type those commands. Um, the the drawback or, or, the, or the downside of that is that you have these modes, this entering and leaving between modes. Uh, so for for using less number of fingers uh, on, on making less complex commands is better. Uh, but still, you need to know that, that, that extra piece of information about uh, moving around. Then what else? Moving around, first line, last line. Okay, copy and paste. Okay, so let's go to the first line here. Uh, When I use the, okay, yes, uh, late. Uh, I'm reading your from your chat. Um, yes, both Emacs and Beam, they create some sort of backups for for the files that are, that they are using. Uh, so as you mentioned, if you didn't properly save the file or you just close the terminal. Abruptly, and uh, there is one file that I imagine I, I think it starts with uh, with the sharp symbol. Let's see if I can. It, it's hard for me to to force that the, the close of that. I think that the file that starts with sharp is always there. It's like a backup, and when you open, it will ask you. Uh, do you want to recover the, the file? Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can just delete the backup 
uh, and that that message will disappear. But the, the, by default, the the, the backhead file uh, it will be there. So that's why you are you are reading that file. You are you are, you are getting that message. Um, I, I imagine that that's what you are asking. For. Is this this backhead format that is generated? Um, so, um, okay, I think, let me see if I can force this thing. Oh, I can close. Yeah, usually the file will be, let me see, let me see if I can force this. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, imagine that I, I will be doing something on uh, here. Uh, I will be mimicking that thing. Uh, yes. So I will be killing this process. Uh, Yes. So now, now notice the, the, the what I did. Why I open I open uh, uh, the file, but I interrupt and I kill the process for BI that was editing the file. So I end up with this file here. That is like a record of the changes and. So if I try to enter again in the file with BI. It will always show me this message. Uh, there is a file, uh, uh, and there is something. The file doesn't look clean, uh, so I can just quit. And if I, so you can delete this file, or this file, and this file, to get a clean aspect. So I'll let let me edit those. That's all. Is this file uh, and is this one this file? So you can just delete those, and that message will disappear. The next time that I edit the file, it will be clean. Is that what you want? Oh, perfect. Um, so yes, that. By the way, uh, uh, something similar happens with Emacs. Emacs in the case of Emacs. And the files uh, is this one. It's like a copy. It's a copy of, of the file, um, which which could be a something that you don't want, especially if the file is, is big like this one. It's making a copy of that file, I'm sure. Uh, so again, it's something that you can delete if you want, and you can preserve the file if you want. Um, so let's continue here on this. Copy and paste. Uh, again, when you are here, you are you are in, in command mode for copying um, the the section first. Make a section, make a selection. You enter in what is called a visual mode. You hit V, V to enter into visual mode. And uh, with this, you can make selections. Let me see in here. Up to here. Now, there are two ways of copying this, and this is where the eye becomes a little bit confusing. Um, you can copy, if you copy just with Y, it will include the, uh, the uh, location of the cursor. The cursor is located here. So let me make it here. So I will be copying, including the, this comma here. And this is what I link. So I will insert in a few spaces for making this clear. But going back to, uh, to command mode. And for pasting, it's with T. And notice that here I end up with the comma. 
S is one. So another, so that means if I enter in visual mode and I copy here up to here, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say copy with one. Uh, and here I'm making some space. I will be making some space here. And I paste it. Notice that the first letter, the letter that is on top of the uh, of the uh, of the cursor is included in the in the copy. That's usually not what you want. Uh, usually what you want is visual mode, selecting a few lines, but what you want are those lines, not the extra A. So you press Shift one and that copy will not include the cursor. Uh, so let me see here. And I will paste here. And it will be like this. Now, uh, what else you can do? This is copy and paste with Emacs. Uh, okay, the, okay, the same thing for, for cutting uh, is visual mode. Let's say, uh, let's say visual mode here, and I will be deleting this section, these lines. So I press. Let's say shift D because I don't want to include the line where I'm sitting. Uh, and I'm cutting that text and I paste in that text here. So that's cut and paste. Um, searching. Okay, and the searching and replace. There, okay. So searching is like this. And you can, after you hit a search, you can go to, and you press N for all the instances and those are highlighted on all that. And now replacement. This is actually very powerful replacement. So that's why this start differentiating from the others. No, in Onimax, you can also replace with with regular expressions. So but this one is the nice one. Uh, so I would be doing something. The same thing that I did for the others. Uh, this is how you replace. You search and replace or with B. You type the, the whatever you are searching for um, and the text that you want for the text. This is actually a simplification that you can do far more complex things with this. Um, and it will start asking for all the cases that you want to replace or just hit A for all. And that's full replacement. And here is a reference card for BI, okay? Uh, a very powerful editor. Uh, the idea here is that with these commands, you move around. So the, the four keys for moving. Uh, you can also scroll up and down. Uh, there are ways for uh, tweaking this editor a lot. So, or putting lines on top of, I remove those things, by the way, for, for this session. But you can, let's say, edit your, the environment for this. So you get really customized environment for programming, for, uh, for highlighting the codes is something that we will do in a minute. Uh, that's why this kind of languages are, are preferred. Uh, that this kind of editors are preferred, for example, Emacs uh, on BI over a very simplistic approach uh, like uh, like that. Okay, for the exercise, the exercise, uh, I have actually three. Yes, I have three exercises. So the first one is simple. Pick one editor, could be uh, nano, and do it by yourself. Not just copy and paste this, but actually go and, and uh, 
uh, and edit the file. One small extra challenge will be to copy this, so the, the, this section, copy all inside your editor, copy this line and paste it twice and edit the, the internals. So you get a feeling of what you are doing when you are copying, because this is a for loop, this is a for loop. And inside here, there is a for uh, line compressed and this is a for, so this has some, some commonalities. So, one thing to, to at least experience a little bit how you do that is copy the line and paste it twice uh, and edit the file. So pay attention, do this. And after you can compile this, actually you can compile this code and here is the, the compilation line. So once you save the file, if you save the file with this name, which I recommend, copy the file with this. Um, Compile the compile the code executing this command and execute. That that's and a small exercise of it. And we have like twenty minutes for it. And another thing is to enter in in X eleven. And I think I did. I did that. Let me see. Uh, some way of testing this. No, I never did. Oh, yes. Oh yes, probably I did up to a point. Um, I think now I have a nice somehow. Oh, okay. Uh, Yes, that is what I'm looking for. Right. This is how, how I prove that myself that, that I have X11 running uh, for me. So for the, yeah, uh, the second part is just more like a small game to edit one file. L is this. L, so, and this is something to show you that an editor like VI will highlight the code, uh, which is which helps for the readability of this file. Uh, so all that you have to do here is to module those. Uh, and it's described on uh, uh, Java. This is a small Java code. Java, Java C. Uh, uh, wait a second. Java. moving the screen. This is why you refreshing somehow. So the challenge is to edit this file. So click this. And explore a different set of, uh, of values here. So use the editor, change a little bit the, the parameters here and recompile and, and run. So this is something a little bit like the like experience that you do when you are editing code. Uh, change a few of the numbers. There are many, many numbers around here to, to tweak. Um, 
so that's something that you can do. And finally, the, uh, the third exercise is with this file, executing this, uh, and basically do what I did for you. So open, go to the first, with the editor that you choose, go to the first line, go to the last line, uh, and search for a very specific line. For example, this one, uh, the data from June 30, uh, 2021. Uh, and so we have like 15 minutes for this. Uh, 